We're going to be in the Haftor portion of this week, which is going to be uh, 2 Kings, the seventh chapter. This has been one of my favorite stories since I was a wee young man. Uh, I like it because it sort of has heroic vibe to it. Accidental hero type deal or heroes. And I'm going to take the text. We're going to read it because it's a it's a very short. Let's see. Should be a short text. It's not too long. And uh, we will. Uh, I'm going to break it down here, and I've, I've got a, a lesson that we really could learn from this. This is really good. It says in 2 Kings 7, it actually, the Torah portion starts at the third verse, but I'm going to start with 1, verse 1, because the prophet is speaking here, Elisha, and it says, uh, he said, hear the word of the Lord, thus saith the Lord, this time tomorrow, say uh, of choice flower shall sell for a shekel at the gate of Samaria, and two shares of barley for a shekel. And the aide on whom's arm the king had leaned spoke up and said, spoke up and said to the man of God, even if the Lord were to make windows in the sky, could this come to pass? Like, really? Look at our situation. We're surrounded by the Armenians. Uh, they are threatening to kill us. Our women are eating their children. We're starving to death. Like, how in the world could this ever happen? He said, and he, re and he retorted, you shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. Interesting concept. Well, the story starts in the third chapter, or the third verse, and it says that there were four lepers outside the gate. They, had, they said to one another, why should we sit here and wait, wait for death? We decided to go into town. If we, if, if, if we decide to go to town, what with the famine in the town, we shall die there as well. And, and if we sit here, we're going to die. Come, let us desert to uh, the Armenian camp. If they let us live, we shall live. And if they put us to death, we shall die. Basically, hopefully we get put out of our misery. They set out on at twilight for the Armenian camp, but when they came to the edge of the Armenian camp, there was, there was no one there. The Lord had caused the Armenian camp to hear the sounds of chariots and the sounds of horses and the din of uh, a huge army. The din, basically the judgment of a huge, huge army that was coming. They said to one another, the king of Israel must have hired the kings of Hittites and the kings of Mizarim and attack us. They fled headlong in, twilight, in the twilight, abandoning their tents, their horses, their asses. The entire camp was just left as it was. Then those lepers came to the edge of the camp, and uh, when the lepers came to the edge of the camp, they went into one of the tents and ate and drank and carried off the gold and silver and clothing from there and buried it. They came back and then went into another tent. They carried off what was in that tent and buried it. Then they said to one another, eh, we're not doing right. This, this is a day of good news, and we're keeping silent. If we wait until the light of the morning, if we incur guilt, come, let's, let's go inform the king's palace. They went and called out the gatekeepers of the city and told them, we have been in the Armenian camp, which is not a soul there, nor any human sound. But the horses were tethered and the asses were tethered and the tents were undisturbed. The gatekeepers called out, and the news was passed to the king of the palace, and the king arose in the night and said to the courtiers, I will come, I will, I will tell you what the Armenians had done to us. They know that we are starving, so they have gone out of the camp and hidden in the fields, thinking that when we come out of the town that they can attack us and they will kill us. But one of the courtiers spoke up and said, let a few of the remaining horses uh, uh, the remaining horses that are still in here be taken, and they are like those who are left here, uh, here of the whole multitude of Israel, out of the whole multitude of Israel that have been perished, blah, 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 went on and on. 
And obviously the story goes that they get there, not only are they You're muted, Rod. Oh, my Lord. Why didn't somebody turn on a microphone and tell me like an hour ago? Well, it just happened. It just happened, yeah. Are you serious? Like how long ago? When, when did it happen? Like seconds. Mr. Oh, okay. I thought it had been off the whole time because I have my yeah. text in front of me. I'm thinking, what an idiot. I'm sitting here just mumbling and no one can hear me. Anyway, so the story is that uh, they are you know, the whole city of Jerusalem is saved by these four lepers. Now, we had a discussion, and last night Steve did a great job talking about the Torah portion. And, uh, you know, we, we, uh, Cheyenne had some good questions about the leprosy and the who does it attack. And actually throughout the, the Haftor, uh, throughout the Tanakh, uh, there are about eight individuals that were attached to with lep leprosy. Uh, Cheyenne mentioned one, Pyro. Uh, Moses was another one. You remember at the, at the burning bush, he was told to put his hand in his cloak and pull it out, and it showed its sarats. Miriam, uh, Moses's sister, had sarats, um, and this happened because of of her negative speech, uh, Naaman, you know, we know that Naaman was a fantastic Noahide and one of the first examples of a Noahide, he had Sarats, uh, all for the purpose. He goes to Alicia and the, the advisor tells him what to do. Now, Gezial, or, I'm sorry, Geza Z, Gehaza, Gehazi, Gehazi, I said it right. Uh, he was Naaman's, uh, like, I guess, uh, armor bearer or something. And he went and tried to swindle money out of, out of Naaman, and he ended up getting Sarats. And then there are the four lepers. These are actually three brothers and a father. All of them had Sarats. And they were told they had to go outside of the camp. Now, let's just for a second examine what Sarats is. We all know, but just to recap for those who might be listening or watching and may not know, but the Tzaratz uh, of this time is not the leprosy of today. It is a, it's a white skin condition that shows up. Uh, it's not like an infectious disease like we see uh, of other skin diseases, but it's a, it's a condition that actually is an outcrop of an internal uh, negative aspect of one's character that needs to immediately be ratified or taken care of. Uh, it's an immediate place of judgment requiring tshuva in this whole thing. But it's interesting that Tzaratz is not like any other sin in the sense that most, you know, the sins are prescribed within the Torah uh, if it's theft, there's a specific thing to pay back reparations, to do this, do that, then bring offerings, et cetera. With Sarats, they had to isolate themselves, go outside of the camp. So it seems like that Sarats seems to be tied to, uh, what do you call it? Um, I don't know what the word, maybe sociological kind of sins, like things that you would do in a, and a human to human aspect. It's something wrong. It's not like that you've stolen from someone, but yet if you treat people uh, cruelly, if you have darkness inside of you that you're not dealing with, it's going to show up on the outside. So this is the plight of the four men. Now, the four lepers, also it is known and said something about the Mashiach having uh, leprosy or being with lepers. That's a whole nother topic that we could bring up later on. Uh, as I begin to examine this, this lesson, I thought, what and why does this portion, Haftor portion, get attached to the current one? Well, obviously, it's clear they're talking about Sarats in the Torah portion, and obviously, they bring this example of Sarats, of the four men. 
I find it interesting that even though Tsarat seems to be such a, a, a scary, ugly thing, it didn't happen a whole lot. It was very limited. And it was only limited to very unique people that this would show up on. And I think somewhere this tour portion or this huff tour portion teaches us something powerful about how to deal with adversity and difficulty and why it's important to understand that regardless of your status in society, your status within the world of Torah, your status within your, your community, one can still be viable in their usefulness to be a tool for the hand of Hashem. It says that the sages of Judaism, and I, I read through several different sources, Judaism doesn't do a whole lot of commentary on 2 Kings 7, 3 through 20. There's just not a lot there. It's sort of just stated. Well, it says that, that it seems that the scribe that wrote this down wanted to make sure this little blurb is in the long story for a reason. And the reason tells us about hope and faith and how powerful uh, they are in motivating an individual. We were just talking before class about someone who is struggling uh, to get back up on their feet after being in prison. And uh, look, a lot of people in prison end up turning back to their old ways because they just can't seem to combat it. They're almost like the lepers saying, let's just go back in the village. If they kill us there, pff, so what? At least we're, we're gone. We don't have to deal with this. And something about the level, level of desperation that we can have during the most difficult times can be the very instrument that God uses to help rescue a people. Now, it said that, uh, according to the sages, that God didn't perform this miracle as much as he did this because of their boldness. Does that make sense? It's like he didn't, he didn't make all this happen. It's like they decided to do it, and Hashem went with them. He, he went with them, and he, what do you call it, uh, magnified their footsteps. And uh, who knows? I mean, obviously, they couldn't have been carrying too much. They were paupers in, outside of the city, starving to death. So this idea of the uh, hope and, and faith being such a powerful motivator in the story, the four lepers are actually starving outside of the gates of Samaria, and they decide to take a chance and go their faith and they hope that they might be able to find a solution to their own problems gave them the motivation to take action. One of the greatest things about Judaism is this uh, idea that every person has to take um, personal responsibility. You have to, you have to make actions for yourself. Someone cannot repent for me no one can do tshuva for me. No one can rescue me. I have to rescue myself. Now, mind you, we all can come to the aid of somebody in a difficult situation. We can give charity. Um, I, I just found out this morning that the chaplain that died, uh, the, the Jewish chaplain that died uh, here recently, um, the insurance has not kicked in uh, because she's in... Ohio, she tried to file the paperwork in Florida where her husband died, and it, it's been a big mix-up, and so the family is going without money right now, so we're, we're working on a GoFundMe to help, help her and, and take care of her, but at the same time, I would, I would encourage her in this situation, you know, don't allow the desperation of a situation to break your hope and your faith, and I'm sure she hasn't. She's a tzaddika. She's a good, powerful woman, but she has three children and all of them are teens and below. And to think about the struggle that she's having, that is desperation. Now, the, the idea is taking action is necessary. What did I mean before about Judaism and why it's so fantastic? It, because it puts the burden of responsibility upon us as individuals. We have to take action. Now, some would say, well, is it a good action? Is it a bad action? Should I do it? Should I not do it? But when you're starving to death, when you're in desperate situation, you'll do anything 
to uh, to survive. Uh, I know that we joke and give uh, people from Louisiana a hard time because they'll eat anything, and they, you know, we we give them a hard time. But these people would have died in the swamps if they didn't eat the things they ate. Everything trafe, everything a Jew would never touch. They had to eat it to survive. There's just things you have to do. You have to take the necessary steps. So taking action is necessary. That's the second point of this lesson. The lepers took action by going to the Armenian camp, and this action led to their discovery of the abandoned camp and the abundant resources available there. This teaches us that sometimes we need to take action and be proactive in seeking solutions to our problems rather than simply waiting for things to happen. My wife was doing some counseling with someone this week uh, from, from out of town. We've known this person for 40 years, and she's our age. And she, after a very long conversation, detailed that she was going to move in her car and sleep in her vehicle. And she was like, why would you do this? She goes, well, the rent's gotten too high. My job at Walmart, I can't afford it. Uh, to pay, you know, $900 a month in rent. So I'm going to go stay in my, my car. And my wife is like, what made you decide to do that and not go to your mother's or your daughter's or go buy a travel trailer? You know, there are other solutions, but for her, anything other than the immediate thing in front of her, she can't even, her mental health is so bad. She can't even fathom trying to figure that stuff out. And so my wife is trying to give her good advice, like, hey, you know, you can go get a travel trailer. Why don't you talk to your mother and see if you could stay at her house, blah, blah, blah. You know, giving her advice, but she could not hear it. It's like she seemed to be focused on needing to get to the car and just be in the car by herself, sort of wallow in her own misery. There's times that you've got to take action. And this is very important. The good news is uh, that good news needs to be shared. It's important during the time of your struggle and your ultimate recovery that uh, these lepers dis discovered something that was pretty great. Notice that they decided to tell everybody else after they got all of the <laughs> gold and silver they could carry and the clothes and the food that they, they stowed away in a secret spot. Then they decided to tell some other people. That's what you call desperate people, desperate uh, times make uh, make make desperate people. Uh, it says that they they felt bad about it, or they figured we should tell them. Then they went back to the city and told the people about what they had found, which immediately led to the end of the siege and the salvation of the city and the Jewish people. This teaches us that when we experience success or good fortune in the face of adversity, we should share that good news with others and help them find the hope and motivation as well. I just recently told you about a visit with my cousin and, and how rewarding it was knowing that she has been battling with cancer for so long. And yet they tell her it'll never end. This is going to be forever battle for you until the end of your life. And even though they're not saying that she's going to die, just her sharing the, the hope and the optimism and the reward of the struggle and what it's done for her family and how it's taught her to mature and, and to uh, become a better person was an incredible inspiration. And I was not even going through that. So the, the power of sharing good news with people is so very important. Now, last of this uh, section that I wanted to point out is that in one's desperation, God always provides a way out. It's going to require you to do the action, but God will give you a way to roll this thing out and make it work. The story also emphasizes uh, God's role in providing a solution to the problem. The leper's discovery of the abandoned Armenian camp and only the subsequent defeat of the Armenian army was seen as an act of God's providence. This teaches us that even in the face of unseemly, unsurmountable adversity, we can find hope and trust uh, that God can make a way out. If you are uh, big into news, uh, 
watching news or watching Facebook or whatever it may be, uh, you will be overwhelmed by the level of desperation that's in the world that we live. And it can be very easy to get blindsided and think, well, there's no hope. This thing is just going down the tubes. I don't know what to do, follow into desperation, but we can't do that. We're godly people, we're pious people, and our actions, the lives of many other people are dependent upon your actions. I know that sounds crazy, like, oh, it's just this, you know, just the eight of us here. How does how that have anything to do with it? Remember that our decisions, our thought process, our, our actions, regardless of the necessity of why you do your actions the way you do, have an impact. Now, we always talk about the negative impact of Tsarats and evil speech, et cetera, et cetera. But conversely, there are actions that we conduct in our lives that are positive that has an effect on people. And just as negative a speech affects people, positive affirmation and positive speech affects the world around us. These people, uh, these four men saw the provision of God in the midst of the worst time of their life, and God delivered the people of Israel out of this. What do we get from 2 Kings, uh, the seventh chapter, verse 3 through 20? We get the fact that desperate times call for desperate measures, and sometimes we have to take and, and, and make the step. Sometimes the step is a lonely one because no one else is going to do that with you or support you during that time because of maybe the, the difficulties that you're having. Some people don't want to touch you because they feel like that they're going to get affected by the problems that are going on. But have the courage to have hope and faith. Let that motivate you to necessary action. And when that action begins to work itself out, then share the news with people, be positive, affirm the handiwork of Hashem in your life, and let everyone know that even though your actions needed to be sure and swift and on point, God had everything to do with making this happen. So this concludes the Shur, so let's get into discussion now. We can talk about the Haftorah or anything else that you wish.